as Ezra's preparing for this journey, and it is a long journey. We're looking at 900 miles. A 900 mile journey. As he's preparing for this, he's having to get things in place. So when we begin looking in, in verse 21 tonight, we're picking up from, from verse 20 of last time. We weren't here last week, were we? Last time, <laughs> um, we closed out talking about talking about how laborers are needed where Ezra had was seeking out laborers to help him on this journey laborers to go back to Jerusalem with him and we had talked about how comfortable the Jews had become in Persia how they were their life was there many of the Jews that were left had never known Jerusalem had never seen Jerusalem all they knew were what they heard about that temple and about the city wall. About this place where God had set for the Jews to, to live. Um, they had just heard stories about it for the most part. And as Ezra began to gather laborers, God had to work in the hearts of some. Because there were some that did not want to, to leave what they knew. We noticed that the numbers that left this time was far less than what had left the in the first exodus from Persia back to Jerusalem. So here we find that he is preparing. And before beginning this 900 mile journey, Ezra's encouraged the people to prepare themselves spiritually. So what Ezra does is he challenges them. He challenges them to seek the Lord in prayer and fasting, as we see this in, in verses uh, 21 through 23. Let's look in these verses. The Bible says, Then I proclaimed the fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to keep us or to help us against the enemy on the road. Excuse me. Because we had spoken to the king saying the, the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. But his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this. And he answered our prayer. So here we see that that as he's challenging them for prayer and fasting, there, there are three urgent reasons why they need to be praying. Three very urgent reasons to pray. One, people needed to seek the Lord for a safe journey. Uh, they needed God's guidance and God's protection. Uh, whenever we're about to embark on something, whatever journey it may take us on, especially if it's a spiritual journey, we need to seek God's face. There's a lot of things out there. Uh, there's a lot of gimmicks. There's a lot of things that sound good. But we need to seek God's direction and God's guidance. There's a lot of things that that may seem like, well, if we do this, we're going to be right where God would have us to be. But if God hasn't spoken to us and God hasn't laid it on our hearts, we need to seek God's face for that clarity of direction. Um, they needed to also seek the Lord because the trip was lengthy. It was demanding. It was, it was during a perilous time, especially for the children that was going to be present. The roads of that day were were infested with bandits and there were gangs and of, of marauders. Uh, there were people that were just out seeking to take advantage of whoever they can. Now, if you watch TV any at all, uh, you'll see that there's a commercial of a movie coming out. I, well, it's not a movie. It's actually a series that's coming on television. And the first commercial I saw about this series, there was two girls sitting in the car talking. The car's cut off. They're on some de deserted road, road they know nothing about. And all of a sudden, a vehicle pulls up behind them, headlights. And one girl says to the other, 
locked the door. She said, We're, they, they ain't nothing going to happen to us. And all of a sudden, her, her window is smashed in. They're taken. We hear stories all the time. We read in newspaper about people who've been taken, people who are abducted. Um, there are people out there who are lurking with the intention of harming others, hoping that they're going to gain something from it. And this is what they were facing. We're talking about a 900 mile trick <laughs> and bandits everywhere. They needed God with them. They needed God to be there. Passing through territory with all sorts of folks who hated Jews. And the Jews were easy to distinguish. They were easy to, to point out in that day among the people. They didn't just have to hear the last name and know, well, they're of Jewish descent. They could look at their features. Y'all know that, that these pictures people paint of Jesus isn't exactly what Jesus would look like if he was a Palestinian Jew. <laughs> if he was a Palestinian Jew, he wouldn't look like the fair-haired, uh, blue-eyed uh, version that we see often. He would look like the typical Jewish man. And, and so they needed prayer. They needed to be seeking God through prayer and fasting for God's help while they were on this journey. Also, the people needed to seek the Lord because Ezra felt uneasy about asking the king for an escort, a military escort. Now, they needed one. It seems like at this point, Ezra realizes they could be they would do well with a military escort from Persia to Jerusalem but he had done something that pretty well kept him from being able to do this he had persuaded the king that God's hand was on them and because God's hand was on them they were protected and anybody that would come up to harm them they would fall into God's wrath. Well, that being true, <laughs> we best be careful some things that we say, hadn't we? Hadn't we? <laughs> I mean, sir, we better be sure we're not tempting God, that God is actually with us. You know, and I, I think that, that there's a fine line in trusting God and tempting God. And when you cross over into tempting God, then you're, you're in trouble. We see that in the picture of Jesus, right? When he's, on, when he's in the wilderness, he's been fasting 40 days, Satan comes towards him, and he's starting to tempt him. And he tells Jesus, just jump. Before your foot would dash a rock, the angels would come in and swoop you up. God's got charge over them. He's not going to let anything happen to you. Now, y'all know I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He knew it was true. But we don't tempt God. We trust God. There is a difference. And there's a fine line that we can cross. Now, I can say I trust God all I want. But if I go and stand on a railroad track while a locomotive is coming, I trust God. I'm tempting God and we are not to tempt the Lord it's not our job he's given me enough sense to know if this train hits me I'm going to die uh, it, it, there's a, a high percentage that I'm not going to survive it exactly yeah mm-hmm and he knew how to defeat the devil. He defeated him with the word of God. So we must seek God's guidance. How do we do that? Through prayer, fasting, through the word of God. You know, when we're praying and when we're fasting, we should be spending time in God's word during that time. Uh, just sitting up or laying down to pray. Do we, ha do we have God's word on our hearts and minds? Are we meditating on it? Is that leading us into prayer? Are we reading his word and that leading us into prayer? 
Or are we praying and our prayers leading us to his word? The way we're going to be guided, the way we're going to hear from God is through his word. Now, it, it sure will. It'll, so a lot of times we, we hear God, not in an audible voice, we hear him speaking to us, to our heart. And, and if you've been saved, you should recognize that voice. That you should recognize when it is, but the best way to be able to recognize it is spending time here. Because he's not going to tell us to do anything that goes against his word. Uh, here, he needed this escort, but he had already... I, I would not say he, st he stuck his foot in his mouth. I'm not saying that. <laughs> He had made the statement that God was with them. God was going to protect them. So if he went back to the king and said, ah, how about giving us a military escort? It would seem as if he was contradicting what he had, uh, his previous testimony to the king was. So what was important was that his testimony to the king be consistent. That he's living out his testimony to the king. No, they they won't. Well, well, the the one thing is the world is seeing, the world is looking now. Let's just just take right now what we're in. You you've got masks on. And we're, we're in, in the building on Sunday morning, singing, worshiping God with masks on. And the world is looking. And there are some churches who are saying, God's going to protect us. We're worshiping him. He's not going to let nothing happen to us. And what the world sees is, okay, three, four, five. Six folks have tested positive. And so in their mind is, I thought y'all were trusting God and God was delivering y'all. What the world doesn't see is, no, we weren't trusting God. We was tempting God because we were careless. We weren't, we weren't using what God had given us, the gifts God had given us, which is the ability to protect ourselves and then trust him with what we could not do. God doesn't expect us to want him to do what we can do. God wants us to do what we can do and let him do what we can't do. We just have to recognize what we can't do. We can't get people saved. God can. But we can share the word of God to people. So, uh, and, and so many are, in their minds, and in their heart of hearts, they're doing the very best that they can do and they're trusting God when in fact we're tempting God. And that goes for all of us at some point in our lives. Um, so we, we must be careful because the world is watching and when the world watches, they don't know that difference. And because they don't know that difference, they can become very confused when we're saying we're trusting God, but things don't end up going our way. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. They're just, they're, they're looking at it in a different way. Oftentimes, I've been reading a book, oftentimes we want what we want instead of following what God's word says. Because God's word, what God's word says would cause us to change what we want. Yeah, the world's not going to have the respect, but the church will. And I think when the world starts to see the church be the church that the Bible describes, then you'll see more of the world respecting the church. When we're trying to mix the world into the church, 
the world's not going to respect it. They're looking for something set apart, holy, different, contrary to the word, world, contrary to the world. And when they're not seeing it, they're not buying it. Uh, they're not buying that it even exists. <laughs> it's in the Bible he can send people to affirm some things but it's got to be supported by his word his word is his revelation to us at this time I, I believe that with all my heart um and and we, we can't we can't fall prey. That's why we must spend time in his word so that we won't be led astray. So Ezra is now questioning the question arises. We've been talking about this. The question arises about trusting God. Nehemiah, he requested the governor to send an army with him when he went back. And whenever, whether we preach through Nehemiah or we teach through it, whichever we do, uh, we're going to see this. Because in, in chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, then, then I went to the governor in the region beyond the river and gave them, gave them the king's letter. And now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. So he had a, he had a military escort when he was leaving Persia to go to Jerusalem. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he requested the Romans to protect him on his journey uh, from Jerusalem to Caesarea. And so the natural question would be, did Ezra trust the Lord more than Nehemiah and Paul and even the others throughout Scripture who may have gotten help from civil authorities? Would you say he trusted God more? <laughs> and, uh, it's hard to find it <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't say that he trusted God more uh, when we really look at this when we look at it for what it's worth we, we got to keep in mind God's purpose for us is to draw us closer to him he draws us closer to him so that we fellowship we commune with him and it seems this is what was taking place with Ezra Ezra had made this statement to the king and now he's having to stand on the statement that he made. But you know what draws us closer to God than anything? Trouble. Trouble in our lives. Trouble in our families. Trouble, just hardships. They, call, they will cause us to draw closer to God. So God will put us in situations that where we have to draw closer to him, uh, where we are totally dependent upon him. And in this moment, here's Ezra finding himself on this journey for four months, 900 miles. He's totally dependent upon God. He can't depend on an army to protect him. The people he's got with him are vulnerable. So He's got to fully depend upon God. We say a lot of things from here. We say a lot of things from here in Sunday school classes. And if we're not careful, God's going to put us in a situation to where we have to stand on the very things that we say. And it seems that's what was taking place. Um, did he... Uh, well, if, you, if we say this, we could ask the question, why didn't that happen with Paul? Why didn't that happen with Nehemiah? Why didn't that happen with others? Well, God had other ways to get them in, in a situation where they were solely dependent upon him. How often wasn't Paul locked up, chained up? He was shipwrecked. He was bitten by a serpent. He was stoned and left to die. 
Saul's whole life after his conversion was a complete dependence upon God. He chartered out in un, unknown territories just to share the gospel. And he did it with him and one other. You know, it, it was... So we, we find that God has a way to put us in, in a troubled time solely to draw us closer to him. And that's what I'm learning to share with folks that are going through heartache or going through um, sickness is to look for God on this journey. Look for God while you're on this journey. If, if you diagnose with cancer, don't, I, the, the, it's the hardest thing really to hear, or well, one of the hardest things, it's not the hardest, it's one of the hardest things to hear is that you have cancer. But God's putting you on this journey for a purpose. Don't, we, we can't forget that. We can't make light of, of how life-changing this can be, but God's putting us on a journey for a specific purpose to draw closer to him and anything we go through that God brings us out of, it's not for us to just sit back and meditate on and just say, well, God brought me through this, but it's for us to help somebody else and to be able to share the journey with them so that they'll be encouraged through that journey. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It does. I mean, it's right there. Yeah. It, and that's why we have the trials and, and tribulation. Man, if our lives, if the Christian life was a bed of roses, how often would we really trust God? We wouldn't walk by faith. And we can't grow without walking by faith. Yeah. Uh, so it is, it is a journey for us. So in response to Ezra's request for them to for the people to fast and pray, they did just that. They fasted and they prayed. Their prayer was answered. The Lord protected them and the returned exiles. He returned the exiles safely to the promised land. As believers, we should begin every task with prayer. Prayer should be the very first step we take in our task. Uh, if the task is large enough and significant enough, both fasting and prayer should, should precede the task. Jeremiah, well, if we're concerned enough to pray and fast, God will hear and answer. No matter what our need is, if we turn to the Lord, he will protect and he will provide. Uh, God will never leave us alone to face any hardships and sufferings on our own in this life. Jeremiah 33 and 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. He says, Call to me. If we want to see great and mighty things, we got to spend time with him. Yes, and, and, all, and th this promise is contingent on whether or not we call to him. So we want to see great mighty things or spend time with God. <laughs> There's the condition of the promise. Matthew 6, 17 and 18, But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that it does not appear to men that you are fasting. But your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Oh, mm, no. But if we do this and we do it God's way, there's a reward at the end of it. And the reward, <laughs> if it's from him and it's a reward, it's not only something to please us, but it's eternal. It's an eternal reward. Any thoughts or questions? Uh, let's look at verses 24 through 30. Yeah. 
So Ezra, he says, and I separated 12 of the leaders of the priests, Sherebiah and Hashabiah, and 10 of their brethren with them, and weighed out to them the silver and gold and the articles of offering for the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his princes and all Israel who were present had offered. I weighed into their hand 650 talents of silver. Silver articles weighing 100 talents, 100 talents of gold. 20 gold basins worth a thousand drachmas and two vessels of fine polished bronze. Precious as gold. And I said to them, you are holy to God. The articles are holy also. And the silver and the gold are a free will offering to the Lord God of your fathers. Watch and keep them until you weigh them before, you, before the leaders of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel in Jerusalem. In the chambers of the house of the Lord, so the priests and the Levites received the silver and gold, the silver and the gold, and the articles by weight. To bring them to Jerusalem and to the house of our God. Now I just saw something in there while reading that. That I didn't see earlier today. Uh, Ezra saw a need here to guard the treasure that had been entrusted to get safely to Jerusalem. So he delegated the responsibility for this treasure to two leading priests. Sherebiah and Hashabiah. These two priests, they appointed 10 other priests to serve along with them. After their appointment, Ezra weighed, counted, and recorded the donated treasure. Now that's after they were appointed, right? He divides it up to them. This is a huge <laughs> amount of wealth that's been taken to the temple in Jerusalem. Ezra, he weighed all. Uh, he weighed all the items and the wealth. Proceeded to remind the guards that they were both holy. They were both set apart, and they're set apart to God. Now that's convicting, is it not? <laughs> Ezra, Ezra's using his his mind here now. I'm getting. I'm entrusting you with this. I've been entrusted with it. Now I'm going to delegate this to you. And I'm trusting you with it. Remember. <laughs> remember who you are. Remember your call. You've been set apart. You are holy. Just as these articles are. Just as this silver and gold is set apart and holy for God. So are you. <laughs> so he's telling them there. We, the count should be right when we get. To Jerusalem 900 mile trek <laughs> when they get to Jerusalem the count should be right see this treasure had been given as a free will offering to the Lord and it must be carefully guarded till it was returned to the house of the Lord the treasure would be reweighed <laughs> and counted in Jerusalem before being turned over to the religious authorities or the religious leaders in the temple. Now he's charging them to take special care of the treasure. He's making sure nothing was stolen or lost along the way. So after giving this charge, he turns the treasure over to the guards. Now before he does this, he tells them, before you give it to them in the temple, we're going to count it again. <laughs> They're set apart. They're holy under God. But they were human. And Ezra didn't forget that. What a man has done, any and every man is subject to do the same. No matter their calling, no matter the, what God has set them apart for, we're flesh and blood. And we're subject to things. So, he, he just let them know. Isn't it easier to be honest when you know you're being watched? You know, that's why thieves break in at night. 
when no one's home, at least smart ones, <laughs> when no one can see, and homes that don't have burglar alarms and don't have cameras around. Uh, when it seems to be obvious that if you come in here, you're going to get caught, chances are you, you're, you're going to be aware and you're not going to put your hands on what don't belong to you. Um, you know when little kids are, are try to take something? When mom and daddy's got their backs turned. Or when they're in another room. They try to sneak something in their pockets or in their hands and they run off to their bedrooms. Uh, here he's telling them, we've counted this. <laughs> now I'm going to give it to you. But before it leaves your hands, we're going to count it again. <laughs> Uh, we're going to ensure this belongs to God. It don't belong to you. And though you're set apart, we're going to we're going to we're going to make sure that things are in the up and up. Listen, any any pastor, <laughs> any pastor should be okay. Should be okay with the church checking behind him. Listen, I tell you, every Sunday you should follow me in the scripture. When the message is over, go back into the scripture and see if I was right. You should be checking up behind me. and Make sure I'm where I'm supposed to be. and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't want to put my hands on the money and, and control anything to do with money here at the church because I don't want there to be a, a chance of impropriety when it comes to money because I never over that. And no pastor will ever over that. Uh, there's a lot of things we can... There's a lot of things we'll find grace for over time. That's one thing we won't find grace for. Um, and so we, uh, it, it, any pastor should welcome accountability. Huh? They should, but every treasurer won't like it. Because every church member don't like being held accountable, do they? Oh, the hardest thing for a Baptist pastor to do, what is it? Hold those in leadership accountable. Because the first thing they're going to throw up in the, in the face is, we're volunteering, I ain't got to do this. Oh. <laughs> Hmm. We'll move on. <laughs> we'll move on. Uh, so here Ezra provides for us a strong example of faithful stewardship. That's exactly what he provides. He's a strong example of faithful stewardship. Too often we find that we must be faithful stewards of all that God's given us. Whether it's money whether it's abilities or whether it's responsibility. You've heard me say our time, our talent, and our treasure. It's right there. Our money is our treasure. Our abilities is our talent. Our responsibility is our time. We must be faithful stewards of this. Uh, we're, we're to carefully protect and increase what God has given us. If we, anything that God's given us, it can't go unused. It can't be undeveloped. Rather, we use our skills and our abilities as strong witnesses to further the kingdom of God. Whatever God has gifted us with, it's to bring him glory. If it doesn't bring him glory, then it's useless and we're not using it. I, I have serious issue when when a church is in need of, of something that, that, provide, that is only provided through a specific skill set, and that skill set is sitting on the pew and refuses to use that gift or that skill set for God's glory. Instead, because they've gotten upset. Well, the guitar player got upset with the, with the choir director because they were doing the kind of music they didn't want to do. That ain't got nothing to do with the scripture. You'll not find anywhere in scripture where it talks about preference of music. 
What God says is sing to him. Make a sweet aroma to him. Let it be a worship to him. What style we sing, you're not find that nowhere. That's all preference. That's man-made stuff. And to sit back with the gift of playing and saying, I'm not doing it because I didn't get my way. You know, truth is, most divisions within the church has nothing to do with biblical matters. It's pride. It's pride. It's lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And has nothing to do. We'll get upset over not getting our way, but we won't get upset that, that we're breaking God's command. Mm. I'm not going back to that church. They cut Sunday school out. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, there. There's people will say that, but nobody gets upset when no one's taking care of the sick and the shut-in, the widows and the orphans. No one gets upset or offended about that, but it offends God. Shouldn't we be more offended about that than offended over the style of music or? What we do with a building that God, God doesn't need. He's shown us he doesn't need the building here this year, hasn't he? Yeah. Um, uh, we must be faithful stewards of what he's given us. And we are to carefully protect what he's given us and increase what he's given us. We see that in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Y'all remember that storyline? Storyline of the talents. The landowner gives five to one servant, two to another, one to one. The five doubled his when the landowner come back. Uh, the one with two doubled his, and he was pleased. But the one with one, he protected his. He didn't invest it. In other words, he didn't use it for any glory. He just hid it. He'd rather protect it and keep that one than to take a chance on gaining a second one. And God, <laughs> God's not pleased when we fail to use what he's given us. Um, when it comes to our stewardship of money, we're to guard it. We guard all that's entrusted to our care, but we're not to carelessly handle it. Um, we don't want it stolen. We don't want it. Uh, we don't want to just lose it. We don't want to spend it foolishly because it's from God. But it does teach us to invest it. How is the best way to invest money God's given us? Uh, the best way to invest it is to in people. Who are we to love? People. Love one another. We invested in people. We invested in the gospel ministry being carried forth. That's why we give to missions. That's why we give to the Gideons. That's why we give to, to those who we have the golf tournament so that people outside of our church that, that come requesting for, for help, we have funds that we can help them. And we use that, those funds. I hope that's what we're using those funds for because that, those funds are coming in from outside the church and we should take care of our church within our church. Um, we do give. Some of our church members give to the golf tournament. So if they want to help out some of our church members, but the church shouldn't neglect our church members just because that is an avenue. Uh, we, we're entrusted with this to invest it and the best way to invest it is to help the needs of people and the more we give faithfully for God's glory the more God gives us so the more he gives us the more we are to give and then he'll give us more <laughs> if they give the 10 percent well and you know what we we tend to feel like we have the opportunity and the privilege to say what happens to it. 
in a conversation recently. A person said, well, I asked if they were still going to their church. And they said, no. And there's always excuses why people don't go to, to their church. And, uh, and she said, but I take my tithe and I don't spend it. I set it in the side compartment here of my pocketbook and I give it to people that are in need. I said, really? That's interesting. That's all I said. It's her business between her and God, right? But she's just disobeying God's word. She's stealing from God and, and taking glory for it because God says take it to the storehouse. Well, you know, sometimes they just won't use it the way it needs to be used. That ain't yours to worry over. Yeah. You, know, you know what I, and here's what God spoke to my heart and said. I never really put this together. I, I, I should have. I was ashamed of myself. But he really spoke to me to help me see this. That he asks us or he commands us to give 10%. We get to keep 90% of what he's given us. Because we couldn't have anything without him. He's just saying, give me 10% of it back. Now we've got 90% that we can take part of that to help somebody in need. <laughs> but we won't because we want that 90% for what we want. We're okay with, with giving them the 10% that belongs to God. But the 90% that belongs to us, that's mine. And I want this. And I'm not waiting an extra month because I've been waiting six months saving up for this. <laughs> that's uh, uh, but God is he's doing this not because he needs our money God don't need nothing from us we need everything from him but what he is doing is helping us see our faith he's helping us to see he knows our faith <laughs> he's helping us to see whether we're we're faithful or not nothing comes as a surprise to God it may, it may shock the life out of us, but it don't come as a surprise to him. Ephesians 4 and 28 says, Let him who still, still no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, what is good, that he may have something to give who has need. So if we use our, our talents and our time and our treasures for his glory, then we'll have everything that we need. We're responsible with what we're entrusted with giving a strong witness of diligence in serving the Lord. Colossians 3 and 23 says, Whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to man. So, after the Any questions or thoughts? Any questions or thoughts? We want to stop there. We'll get these. We have to give it. Yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. If we're dreading and it's breaking our heart that we're having to, to obey the Lord, it's, <laughs> well, he's not getting any glory out of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there's a uh, God loves a cheerful giver and it takes God to help us to be cheerful it takes him really pouring into our lives it takes him directing our path which means we're spending time with him and we're being obedient to him if we're failing to be obedient to him and he's not guiding us, and we're not spending time with him, then we're not going to display the attitude and the mind that God would have us to, uh, because we need him. Now, when I got saved, I got every bit of the Holy Spirit that I'm going to ever need to get to heaven. But I can draw closer to God along this journey on earth. I know the Holy Spirit's in me, so I can't get no closer than that. When we say this, 
we're saying that we're getting more of him and less of us is shining in our lives. Right now, we have the spirit and the flesh warring. Who are we going to feed the most? If we feed the flesh, the flesh is going to win. If we feed the spirit, the spirit's going to win. And when the world begins to see more of Christ and less of us, then we begin to have a true kingdom impact on this world. And that should be the impact that we're wanting to have, a kingdom impact. I don't want to be known for... I don't want to be known for the things that's going to gain praises of men. I want to be known for things that's going to give glory to God. And I think that's the way we're all supposed to live our lives. Now, I fail at it. I fail at it. Uh, I'll be the first pastor to say I fail at it. But God's still working on me. Just as he is all of us. Um, but the more, if we're going to ever become the church God wants us to be, we've got to see more of him and less of us. Here, Ezra shows us an example of just trusting God, just depending solely upon him for everything. They take this 900-mile journey. It's a journey that takes four months. And he's dependent on God every moment of it. I pray that you're dependent on God for every moment of your life. Especially right now, you, go, you leave your home and go into any store, you're dependent on God. Your mask is a defense. Staying a certain distance from other people is a defense. But God is the one that's going to allow that to take place. God's the one that will keep you safe. And if he allows you, if he allows you to get this virus, he'll be with you as you recover, whether it's on this side or the next. He'll be with you. Let's do what we can, and then we can trust him with whatever the rest is.